How do you know if you've been acting in pride? Here's Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth. When is the last time you said these words to a family member, to a friend, to a coworker? I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Now, let me tell you, if it's been more than a month, mark it down. Haven't you sinned in a month? When's the last time you said that to your husband? I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? And why is it so hard for us to say those words? Why? Because we're proud. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, co-author of Seeking Him. For February 16th, 2023, I'm Dana Gresh. We all need to learn about humility, and then we need to keep being reminded of it over and over. That's why we're focusing on the importance of humility all month long here on Revive Our Hearts. Nancy's teaching from the workbook she helped write, Seeking Him, Experiencing the Joy of Personal Revival. This week we want to talk about what I think biblically is one of the most foundational elements of seeking the Lord. It's the foundation for experiencing and enjoying the presence of the Lord in personal revival and in corporate revival. It's the starting place. If you miss this step, you will never experience revival. You'll never experience the nearness of God in your life, in your marriage, in your home, if you miss this very foundational principle. What is it? Well, if we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, that verse that's familiar to us, the scripture says, if my people who are called by my name will, what's the first thing? <laughs> Humble themselves. Humility. Humility, the thing everybody says they want, but most of us don't realize how much of it we lack and need. We see the absence of it in other people more than we can see its absence in our own lives. And so this week we want to talk about humility and its converse, pride. So by looking at pride, we'll see what it is that God needs to change and what we need to repent of to have humble hearts. Isaiah 57 Verse 15 tells us how important God views humility. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity and his name is holy. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. Notice all those references to God being high. He is lofty. He is exalted. He is elevated. He is high up above us. And God says, my address, the place where I live, is this high and holy place. He is transcendent. He is further beyond and above us than we could ever imagine. But God says, I have another address. There's another place where I live. Besides the high and the holy, exalted place, I also dwell with him who has a contrite and a lowly spirit, or a humble spirit, as some of your translations say. So God says, I dwell in this high, transcendent place far beyond what you can ever imagine or what you could ever attain to, but I also dwell with those, close to those, at home with those who have a humble and a contrite spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You want to experience revival in your life? The starting place is a contrite and a humble spirit. You want to experience revival in your home, your marriage, with your children? The starting place is humility, a humble, a contrite, a lowly, a broken heart. So God, who is high and lifted up, says, I stoop down, in effect, to meet with those who have a lowly, a humble spirit. Now, as we mentioned, pride is the opposite of a humble spirit. So I want us to talk about what is pride? What does it look like? How does God feel about it? How can we identify its evidences in our lives? Pride, self-exaltation. God said, I'm the high one. I'm the lofty one. Pride is when we say, I'm the high one. I'm the lofty one. That was Satan's first sin. That's what got him in all that trouble. I will be like God. Self-exaltation, lifting ourselves up. Because when we lift ourselves up, by default, we bring God down. And isn't that what our whole world system does? It deifies man and humanizes God, bringing him down to our level and trying to bring us up to his level. 
Pride is a sense of self-importance. It's my world revolving around me. Self-centeredness, self-absorption. It's all those self-ish words. Pride. Jonathan Edwards said, Pride is the first sin that ever entered into the universe. And it's the last that is rooted out. It is God's most stubborn enemy. He said, pride is much more difficult to be discerned than any other corruption because of its very nature. That is, pride is a person having too high an opinion of himself. Is it any surprise then that a person who has too high an opinion of himself is unaware of it? Again, we can see it in others, but when we have too high an opinion of ourselves, we're unaware that we do. Pride makes us blind to our failures, to our weaknesses, to our need. It makes us think we're okay. Now, we hear a lot today about self-image and people saying, I've got a poor self-image, I've got low self-esteem. According to the scripture, the problem is just the reverse. It's that we think so much of ourselves that we get easily wounded when others don't think highly of us. According to the scripture, the the root issue in our hearts is this this drive to be in control, this drive to have my world revolve around me, this drive to have things work in a way that I want them to work. And when things don't work the way I want them to work, then I have pity parties, I become um, demanding, controlling, all kinds of ways that we manipulate our worlds to get control. This is the essence of pride. It's that business, as one writer said, of thinking much about ourselves and much of ourselves. Even people with what are called inferiority complexes or low self-esteem, what is the the way we're programmed today is to think much about ourselves. How I feel, how I fit in, how other people view me, to think much about ourselves and much of ourselves. Oswald Sanders said that egotism or pride is the practice of thinking and speaking much of oneself, the habit of magnifying one's attainments or importance. It leads one to consider everything in relation to himself rather than in relation to God and the welfare of his people. So we're saying, how does this affect me? The way my husband is behaving, the way my children are acting, the way my coworkers are treating me, the way the weather is, the way my health is, how does this affect me? How does this make me feel rather than What does God think about this? How does this help the welfare, the well-being of God's people? C.S. Lewis put it this way, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. So just how serious is pride? Let me ask you to turn in your Bible to the book of Proverbs, chapter 26. Proverbs, chapter 26. And I want us to read there a series of verses that give us a contrast that helps us see how serious pride is. Verse 1. Now, you'll notice a word in the first uh, 12 verses that recurs over and over again, and it's the word fool. This passage is talking first about a fool. Verse 1, like snow in summer or rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Honor doesn't go with a fool in the same way that snow doesn't go with summer. Verse 3, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. That's how you got to deal with a fool. I mean, it's just he won't listen to counsel, so he just has to have discipline, to reproof the rod, to make him do what's right, to make him go the right direction. Look at verse 6. Whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. It's useless. You're going to get yourself in trouble if you entrust your message to a fool. Verse 7. Like a lame man's legs, which hang useless, is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Fools don't have any wisdom, so what good does it do if they say wise things? It's useless in their mouth. Verse 8, like one who binds the stone in the sling. Now, if you bind a stone in a sling, what's going to happen when you... It won't go anywhere. It won't do anything. It won't reach its object. He says that's the same as if you give honor to a fool. It's foolishness. Verse 9, like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard. I mean, he's just staggering around. He's drunk and he can't see what he's doing. And he just accidentally, you know, pushes his hand onto a stake or a thorn. I mean, didn't feel it, didn't know what he's doing, just oblivious to what's going on. That's like a proverb in the mouth of fools. 
Verse 10, like an archer who wounds everyone. It's when he takes a bow and arrow and just randomly shoots at people walking down the street. Like an archer who wounds everyone. So is one who hires a passing fool or drunkard. They do a lot of damage. They're deadly. Verse 11, this is a kind of awful word picture here. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. He keeps going back to it. Okay, now after reading those first 11 verses, do you want to be a fool? And would you say it's pretty awful to be a fool? It is. Now look at verse 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. What's worse than being a fool? It's being proud. How does God view pride? He says in Proverbs 8, he hates it. He hates pride and arrogance in the evil way. In Proverbs 16, he says it's an abomination to him. God detests pride. God is the only one who's high and lifted up. And we exalt ourselves. When we center our world around ourselves, God says, that is an abomination to me. I hate it. It's actually, according to the scripture, the most heinous sin of which any man or woman can ever be guilty. It's a sin of pride. Now, we don't tend to think of sin that way. We think of, when we think of horrible, heinous sins, what comes to our mind may be some of the types of sexual perversion or just gross wickedness that's in our culture around us, things that aren't our sins, by and large. And yet, when God lists seven things in Proverbs chapter 6 that are an abomination to him, he didn't even mention those things. He does mention pride right there in that top list, the things that God particularly hates. Though the Lord is high, Psalm 138, verse 6, he regards the lowly, the humble, but the haughty he knows from afar. God is high, he says, I stoop down to lift up those who are humble, those who are lowly, those whose world is centered around God rather than around themselves. God says, if you're haughty, if you're proud, if you're self-centered, I'm going to keep you at a distance. I can't draw near to you. I'm going to know you from afar. You'll never be able to draw close to God until you let His Holy Spirit come and plow up those roots, those clods of pride. That's what keeps us far from God. That's what keeps the presence and the power of God out of our churches. It's pride. And we say, yeah, my pastor, he's a really proud man. Or my husband, yeah, he's really proud of those young people. They are uh, those old people. They've been there forever and they are just so proud. No, God says, look at your own heart. You want to see what pride looks like? Look in the mirror. So you say, okay, I want to be humble. How do I know if I am humble? How do I get there? And what do I do about becoming humble? Well, let me tell you what C.S. Lewis had to say. He said, if anyone would like to acquire humility, Anybody here want to acquire humility? We want to be humble. He said, I can, I think, tell him the first step. Are you ready for this? You want to write it down? Mm -hmm. The first step is to realize that one is proud. He said, if you think you're not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. Now, I don't think I like that quote, <laughs> but I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I've come up with 40 evidences of pride. Most of these I know best because they're things I can see in different ways in my own heart. Don't try and write all these down. We'll make this available to you. But here's what I do want you to do. If you have a paper and pencil, I want you to just make a little tick on your paper or if you're too proud and concerned about what other people next to you are thinking, <laughs> do it a mental tally. But I want you to make a note, either mentally or on your piece of paper there, as I read through these, which ones does the Spirit of God kind of point His finger in your heart and say, I see that in you sometimes or generally or a lot of the time. What are some of these characteristics, evidences of pride? And this will help us to see areas that we need to identify as issues of pride in our lives. Number one, do you look down on those who are less educated, less affluent, less refined, or less successful than yourself? Do you think of yourself as more spiritual than your mate 
or people in your church or people in your workplace, other believers? Do you think of yourself as more spiritual than other believers you know? Here's another one. Do you have a judgmental spirit toward those who don't make the same lifestyle choices that you do? Dress standards, how you school your kids, entertainment standards. Think of other believers you know. And do you tend to have a judgmental spirit? Now, maybe you don't think you do, but if you wonder on some of these, you may want to go ask somebody who knows you really well, do I come across that way as having a judgmental spirit toward those who have different lifestyle choices than I do? Here's another one. Are you quick to find fault with others and to verbalize those faults to others? Do you have a sharp, critical tongue? We would call it discerning, analytical, but fault-finding. Jonathan Edwards, by the way, wrote a powerful, convicting piece on evidences of spiritual pride, and this is one of seven that he listed, fault-finding. He said, spiritual pride causes us to speak of other people's sins while humility disposes us either to be silent about them or to speak about them with grief. He said the spiritually proud person shows it in finding fault with other saints. They're low in grace, how cold and dead they are, how quick to discern and to notice their deficiencies. And we can do that and sound so pious, so spiritual. People in my church, they're so cold, they're so dead. Is that a reflection of pride in our hearts? He says, Christian humility causes a person to take notice of everything that is good in others, to make the best of it and to diminish their failings. He said, the truly humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart that he's not apt to be very busy with others' hearts. Fault finding. Here's another one. Do you frequently correct or criticize your mate or your pastor or other people in positions of leadership? Your kids' teachers, youth director, just think about the people who are involved in your life, people in leadership. Are you quick to correct or criticize them, to them or to others? Here's another one. Do you give undue time, attention, and effort to your physical appearance? Hair, makeup, clothing, weight, body shape, trying not to look older. Do you give undue attention to your physical appearance? Are you proud of the schedule you keep, how disciplined you are, how much you're able to accomplish? You're a real producer, real performer. Is that something that you're proud of? Are you driven to receive approval, praise, or acceptance from others? You always need to have a pat on the back, have someone telling you um, how well you're doing, or you get discouraged. Do you, are you driven to receive approval from others? Are you argumentative? You have to have the last word. Think about what it's been like in your home for the last day or two. You know, Proverbs tells us that only by pride comes contention. So where there's contention, yeah, you say, I know, my husband, he's a proud man. That's why we have so much contention in our home. No, it takes more than a proud husband to have contention in a home. It's a proud husband and, more often than not, a proud wife, too. Are you argumentative? Do you generally think that your way is the right way? the only way or the best way. Think about, you know, how you go about cleaning up your kitchen and then your husband comes along and he does it differently. Is your way the right way? Has to be done your way? Do you have a touchy, sensitive spirit? Easily offended. You get your feelings hurt easily. This is another uh, one of the evidence is a spiritual pride that Jonathan Edwards talked about. People who take offense easily. And he said, spiritual pride takes great notice of opposition and injuries that are received and is prone to be often speaking of them. Humility, on the other hand, causes a person to be like his blessed Lord when reviled. Quiet, not opening his mouth, but committing himself in silence to him who judges righteously. How about this one? Are you guilty of pretense? trying to leave a better impression of yourself than is honestly true. And here's a way to go about seeing if you have that one. Would the people that know you at church be shocked if they were to come and discover what you're like at home, behind the four walls of your own home? Another one, do you have a hard time admitting when you are wrong? Is it hard for you to say, I was wrong? Or do you wait for the other person to admit that they were wrong? Do you have a hard time confessing your sin to God or others? 
Not just in generalities. We'll all say, you know, I need to be a better woman. I need to love the Lord more. I need to read my Bible more. But when it comes to the specific issues, I'm in love with food. I'm in love with television. I love entertainment more than I love God. I mean the specifics. Do you have a hard time confessing those? Do you have a hard time sharing your real spiritual needs and struggles with others? What's really going on in your heart? Do you have a hard time praying out loud with others? Are you excessively shy? Say, shy, that's proud. Excessive shyness, what is it? Self-centeredness, what what other people think about me? That can be an evidence, a subtle form of pride. Do you have a hard time reaching out and being friendly to people that you don't know at church? Just stick to your own little group there, but hard to reach out to new people. That can be pride. Do you become defensive when you are criticized or corrected? That anger that wells up, what is that? That's a fruit that grows on the root of pride. Why do we get angry when somebody criticizes us? We may not express it outwardly, but inwardly, because our pride gets hurt. Are you a perfectionist? Here's another evidence of pride, perhaps, in your life. Uh, The way you keep your house, the way you do your job, the way you raise your kids. Are you a perfectionist? Everything has to be just perfect, and you get impatient and irked with people who aren't. Do you tend to be controlling of your mate? If you're not sure, by the way, ask your mate. Do you tend to be controlling of your mate, of your children, of your friends, people in your workplace? Always trying to control, manipulate, manage the people around you. Now, you probably don't do it consciously. That's why we need to ask the Spirit of God to plow up the ground of our hearts and show us what's really under the surface. And He will do that for us. Do you frequently interrupt people when they're speaking? The Lord really spoke to me about this as I was working on this list. And I realized what I'm saying when I interrupt you when you're speaking is, what I have to say is more important than what you have to say. It's pride. Does your husband feel intimidated by your spirituality? Quote, spirituality. How well you know the Bible, how easily you can pray. And he feels, man, I have to go to seminary to measure up to that woman. It may be it's not your knowledge that he's reacting to, but a spirit of pride, a superior sense that you're communicating, maybe without intending to or even realizing it. Again, you might want to ask him. Does your husband feel like he can never measure up to your expectations? What it means to be a good husband, what it means to be a spiritual leader. He's supposed to be romantic and tender and strong and all these impossible composite things that picture we've created of this incredible husband. Does he feel like... I just could never be the husband you want me to be. You often complain about the weather, your health, your circumstances, your job, your church. Complaining, how's that pride? You think you deserve better. It shouldn't be happening to me. Do you talk about yourself too much? Are you more concerned about your problems, your needs, your burdens, than about other people's concerns? Do you worry about what others think of you, about your reputation or your family's reputation? By the way, that's one thing that motivates a lot of parenting, isn't it? With mothers, what other people are going to think if my child is this way? That can be pride. Do you neglect to express gratitude for the little things? To God, to your mate, to others, an ungrateful spirit, that's pride. Do you neglect prayer and intake of the word? How's that pride? Well, I'm saying I can live my life without God. I can manage without Him. Do you get hurt if your accomplishments or your acts of service are not recognized or rewarded in your home, at your job, in your church? Do you get hurt if your feelings or your opinions are not considered when your boss or a mate is making a decision and you're not informed about the changes that took place or the decisions that were made and you get your feelings hurt? Do you react to rules and who of us doesn't? have a hard time being told what to do, have an issue with authority, that's pride. Maybe you think, I'm not proud, I don't have anything to be proud of, I don't have any special gifts, I'm not beautiful, I don't have um, anything, achievements to be proud about. You know what, if you're self-conscious about that, that can be a subtle form of pride. For example, are you self-conscious because of your lack of formal education? So you don't have a college degree and you get uncomfortable or intimidated when you're around people who are more educated. Do you avoid participating in certain events for fear of being embarrassed or looking foolish? 
Do you avoid being around certain people because you feel inferior compared to them? Feel like you just don't measure up? Are you uncomfortable inviting people to your home because you don't think it's nice enough or you can't afford to do lavish entertaining? Is it hard for you to let others know when you need help? Maybe practical help or spiritual help. You have an independent spirit. I can do this on my own. I won't let anybody else help me. And here's a way to measure your pride quotient. When is the last time you said these words to a family member, to a friend, to a coworker? I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Now let me tell you, if it's been more than a month, let me just pick a figure. If it's been more than a month, mark it down. Haven't you sinned in a month? When's the last time you said that to your husband? I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? And why is it so hard for us to say those words? Why? Because we're proud. We have to humble ourselves to say those words. Well, yeah, let me just throw in this last question. Are you sitting here thinking how many of these questions apply to someone you know? <laughs> or feeling pretty good that most of these things don't really apply to you? Yeah, you want to get a tape of this session and hand it to about a dozen people you know. Could that be an evidence of pride? God spoke through the prophet Obadiah to the people of Edom in that prophet's day. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 3, and he said, The pride of your heart has deceived you. The pride of your heart has deceived you. It makes us blind. Here's what Spurgeon had to say about that verse. He said, Pride is self-deceit. Those who are sure that they have no pride are probably the proudest of all. Those who are proud of their humility are proud indeed. The confidence that we are not deceived may only prove the completeness of the deception under which we labor. And so we need to say, Lord, would you show me where I'm self-deceived? Has the pride of my heart deceived me from being able to see what God sees? Has the pride of your heart deceived you, made you blind to the real condition of your heart? As you seek the Lord, say, Lord, show me what you see. Reveal my heart to me. Let me see it as you see it. Show me the pride of my heart. And as you do, I will repent. I will humble myself. I will agree with you. And I will let you bring me to a place of humility. That's a starting place of revival. That's Nancy Damas Walgamuth. Today, she's been giving us a pride test, a very convicting pride test. If you missed any of the questions in that test, you can read the transcript at reviveourhearts.com or on the Revive Our Hearts app. Nancy writes about the danger of pride and the importance of humility in her booklet, Beauty in the Broken, How Humility Changes Everything. Think about it. Relationship coaches, talk shows, self-help books, social media groups— Family counseling will give just about anything a shot when it comes to saving a broken relationship. But none of those things work apart from God's truth. Why? Because those tools often don't touch on pride. Pride is the sin that infects any relationship where two humans are involved. In this booklet from Nancy, you'll learn how to see both God and yourself more clearly. You'll learn to embrace humility, and that virtue revolutionizes all your relationships. We'll send you a copy of the new booklet, Beauty and the Broken, when you support Revive Our Hearts with a gift of any amount. Donations from you and other listeners keep Revive Our Hearts coming to you each weekday, and we greatly appreciate your support, especially if you're a first-time giver. Ask for Nancy's booklet on humility when you call to make your donation at 1-800-569-5959. Again, it's 1-800-569-5959. Or visit reviveourhearts.com. What happens if we say no thanks to humility? Nancy will tell us tomorrow. Please be back for Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, doing our best to show you the freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.